All right, welcome back everyone. Um, today's session is uh, gonna be a little earlier in the day um, and we're happy to have you back so soon from our session on Monday. Today, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Tina Ho. She is a fellowship trained facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon and a board certified head and neck surgeon serving the greater Philadelphia area. Um, so we're excited to see a specialty that we haven't gone through so far. Um, as a few reminders though, for people who are new to the program, each of these sessions is with different specialties and different speakers. Um, we cover not only medicine, but also dentistry. Um, we also have PA speakers. So for those pre-health students out there, we, we really cover um, a good uh, variety of speakers. And for the future, if you'd like to stay tuned with any sessions, you can either subscribe to our listserv. That's an email listserv sent out weekly on Tuesdays. Um, you can do so by going to our virtual shouting page on the website or actually really any page, um, scrolling all the way to the bottom and filling out that subscription form. Or you can also follow us on Instagram. In case it's a bit difficult just navigating the website, you can also email us with your information being your email and your name at shadowing.h, the number four, h at gmail.com. And we can get you manually, manually added onto the listserv. Um, outside of that, we will have a Q&A at the very end of today's session. So if you have any questions for Dr. Ho, please list them in the chat um, and we'll go through them in the order that we receive them. If you have any questions outside of what I just mentioned there, please feel free to email us. We're always happy to help. But with that covered, Dr. Ho, feel free to take it away. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm Dr. Tina Ho. I'm a facial plastic surgeon in the Philadelphia area. Um, so what I will do is, you know, I'll talk about my practice, what facial plastic surgery means, what that covers in terms of the spectrums of uh, conditions and procedures, talk about more um, about my practice specifically. I am uh, currently in private practice and I opened my own practice a year ago and then also to um, go over some before and after cases and then I think that always the best part is to leave it um, open for questions just to you know have that um, dialogue and en engagement um, really you know love to have your support and follow me um, on Instagram uh, my Instagram handle is Dr. Tina Ho D-R-T-I-N-A-H um Oh, and I'm happy to provide my email address later to be as a, a resource um, you know, for any other questions you may have. So um, when it comes to facial plastic surgery, what that means is um, I get to be a face specialist, um, only do procedures of the face or head and neck. Um, in terms of my background, I had my own uh, childhood surgeries um, from kindergarten through fourth grade. I had a large nevus here, a thing like a large mole that had to be removed. It could have been potentially cancerous later. Um, so it led to about 10 reconstructive surgeries and a number of them were done by a surgeon who is still at a Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So um, early on, I, I saw the um, decisive immediate impact my surgeon had on me, and I wanted to have a similar role with patients. So I had an um, early exposure to plastic surgery, the reconstructive side. Um, and then I went to undergrad at College of William Mary, um, uh, double majored in neuroscience and international relations and then medical school at University of uh, Virginia. It wasn't there until I more solidified my interest in facial plastic surgery. I actually didn't really know about it and not much about ENT or ear, ear, nose, and throat until my uh, rotations third year. That's when you do your rotation. So really enjoyed general surgery, my um, core rotation first. And then I had electives in ENT or otolaryngology and plastic surgery. And um, really loved both those rotations, but saw with ENT was a better fit. Um, I liked being more the head and neck specialist to be a specialist more to a certain part of, of the body versus learning surgery for the entire body. Um, I really liked the intricate, delicate um, head and neck anatomy, small blood vessels and veins and cranial nerves, just more delicate structures in the head and neck, and especially related to craniofacial, like the surgeries I've had uh, myself. And um, I saw that there was a route to plastic surgery still with the with the subspecial facial plastic surgery. And I really felt like I, I clicked um, well with the uh, resident and attending mentors they had, where they seemed like 
you know, really smart, but also, um, you know, balanced from a work-life balance standpoint. Within the niche of ENT, think bread and butter uh, procedures are like sinus surgery, tonsillectomy, taking out adenoids, ear tubes, um, taking out some uh, tumors of the head and neck, thyroid surgery. Um, you know, it's a good balance of two to three days of surgery, a lot of it um, outpatient, so the patients don't stay in the hospital, and then doing um, clinic the other two day, two to three days, the procedural um, as well well. So um, after med school, I went to University of Kansas for um, ENT residency. And ENT is a competitive subspecialty. So you have to think about being um, applying broadly uh, to ENT. So never thought I'd end up in the Midwest and only been to Kansas City for my interview and um, was looking to match there. I was really happy, just felt like it was a, a great well-rounded program, had a number of different hospitals you could rotate at not only the academic center, children's hospital, the VA hospital, private practice, but also a strong in facial plastic surgery in case I still wanted to pursue that. Um, residency was five years. And then afterwards, um, I did facial plastic surgery fellowship in Chicago, and that was more in a private practice setting. So six years total. That may sound like a lot, but if you compare to other subspecialties, say if you do medicine or pediatrics first, that's three years plus another fellowship is at least three years. So it's really not too bad, you know, from a, a surgery standpoint to do that. Um, and uh, with facial plastic surgery, um, you know, I felt like I think it's interesting when you decide what medical uh, special you want to do, you definitely want to be very interested in that field of medicine. But a lot of times it's your personality characteristics that may, you know, best align with certain fields. So, um, and of course there are certain stereotypes. So as a surgeon, I'm, I, I like immediate gratification, seeing, um, you know, definitive results, being able to work with my hands, um, you know, get the results sooner instead of, you know, diagnosing and, and, and doing workup for patients. I'm impatient. I think surgeons tend to be that, um, that in that respect. And then from a plastic standpoint, I, I don't mind suturing. Um, I can relate how scars really matter to patients. I'm having scars myself um, for my previous surgeries and um, really appreciate attention to detail, um, uh, you know, mat being meticulous and, um, and I'm okay with the most challenge, dealing with the most challenging patients for the most part, which are the high maintenance cosmetic patients, you know, can, that can be challenging from time to time. Um, so facial plastic surgery in itself, there's a lot of different types of conditions and procedures. So it's really hard to be a jack of all trades, even within facial plastic surgery. Um, so depending on the fellowship you do, you might have more exposure to certain fields or yourself, you know, learn certain procedures to then pursue them um, depending on the type of practice you have later. On the reconstructive side, um, that includes facial trauma. So patients who break bones in their face, whether, you know, um, someone else hits them, they have an accident, like a car accident, um, ATV rollover, also lacerations to the face. So as a facial plastic surgeon, we can go in and repair the facial bones, like a broken nose, the jaw bone, um, the eye, the, the bones to the eye socket, um, and facial uh, lacerations as well. Um, also under reconstructive is skin cancer reconstruction. Um, when skin cancers are removed, um, if they're big enough, they may want a plastic surgeon to repair the defect, whether it's just closing it tight or make creating little flaps um, or skin grafts. Um, these procedures are cool in that, you know, each um, uh, defect is like a new puzzle. There's no single best answer or solution for it. And every single, every defect is different um, that you encounter. Um, also, there's most surgeons out there. Those are trained in dermatology and then remove skin cancer. And um, often they may have a resulting defect that they think is too challenging or cosmetically sensitive, especially in the face. So they may uh, refer the patient to a facial plastic surgeon to close the defect. Um, there's also bigger defects out there. Say someone with a history of smoking and um, alcohol use and they have a big defect, like a lot of their tongue has to be removed. That may require a bigger flap, including what we call as a free flap, where that involves taking a piece of tissue from the arm or leg, for instance, that includes skin, soft tissue, muscle, maybe even bone. And to place that into the defect, you have to make sure you reconnect to arteries and veins to let that flap survive. The patients usually stay up to two weeks in the hospital to make sure that flap survives. So it helps, you know, from a aesthetic standpoint or appearance standpoint, as, as well as functional standpoint to do these bigger um, reconstructions. And 
Um, uh, there's also the realm of facial paralysis. So patients who can have facial weakness or paralysis, whether it's due to surgery, trauma, um, they're born with a facial paralysis, um, that uh, a growing tumor, that there's um, a realm of procedures, whether surgical or non-surgical, to help restore form and function to the face. Maybe to the extent where they can restore some movement or a sym symmetry um, to the face as well. Um, on the cosmetic side, um, so this is a realm that includes more non-surgical. Um, non-surgical can include um, neurotoxin injection like Botox to minimize wrinkles in the face, filler injections to restore volume, definition, projection in the face, um, your skin tightening, uh, skin resurfacing procedures like lasers to help improve skin tone and texture. Um, there's also other non-invasive or non-surgical like thread lifts. Um, and then more on the surgical side, um, cosmetic surgery, including rhinoplasty, um, but it can be functional as well, like septal rhinoplasty to improve nasal breathing, um, facelift, neck lift surgery. This is now more cosmetic. So for the aging face, so facelift, neck lift, um, upper and lower eyelid surgery, um, uh, brow lift, uh, for patients who want to improve facial jawline contouring, which is my growing niche, um, buckle fat removal, chin liposuction, mini neck lift. Um, I also do double eyelid surgery. That's for Asian patients who want um, to have uh, an eyelid crease. Um, so there's like a, you know, just a wealth in terms of spectrum of cosmetic procedures. Um, hair restoration, like hair trans. Plantation. I don't do that. Didn't train in that. Also, facial feminization procedure, um, facial feminization surgery. So procedures to help patients um, achieve a more, you know, uh, feminine look, especially in uh, gender affirmation um, spectrum. And I, I don't have any um, or much experience in that spectrum either. Um, and so after you do fellowship, then it comes time to finding a job. Um, that can be whether it's in academics to be affiliated with um, an academic hospital. You're involved with teaching, research, um, training medical students and residents, um, and uh, or be in private practice where you join a group or you start a practice on your own. The group could be in a setting of a dermatology practice, another facial plastic surgeon, another plastic surgeon, um, an ENT group. So it's kind of that part you don't really learn in your training, but kind of figure out depending on the opportunities, um, what's the best fit for you. So I was open to academics and private practice. Um, I did want to come back to the East Coast. So the best opportunity at the time was to join a dermatology practice. Fortunately, that didn't work out. Um, I then joined a med spa and, you know, still that wasn't the best um environment for me. So I ended up starting my own practice a year ago. Um, the nice part about being in private practice um, is that you have more autonomy, um, whether it's over your hours, the type of practice you want, like patients you see, your brand, you know, whether it comes down to the color scheme, you know, the kind of um, patients you want to see and, um, you know, your logo, and you have more control of your hours. Um, uh, uh, and then in terms of taking call, you know, I only take call for my patients, which is nice. I don't even need to take ER calls. So you might see someone more in private practice have maybe better work-life balance. Um, also that you have higher earning potential because you are the one, you know, when the cash flows in, it's not like you, you take just a cut of that. Um, you're making that minus the overhead. Um, the downsides to, you know, being in private practice. So you don't have as many opportunities for teaching, being around uh, medical students and residents. I am an adjunct faculty through Temple, just at the surgery center I am, so I get to be volunteer faculty and be around residents and uh, fellows in the ENT and plastic surgery department. So that's been awesome. Um, in addition, um, you know, if you're someone who's not as cosmetically oriented or not interested in the business side or wanting to deal with marketing um, and promoting yourself, um, well, that's more challenges in private practice. Um, sometimes like saying you're in academics or a big hospital system, you already have that built in that someone else is worrying that for you and you have already established patient base. Prior practice, yes, you have to start from zero, you know, hustle for patients. You know, it's more risky. It's riskier of, oh, you know, 
how many patients I'm going to see today or tomorrow, especially as a younger surgeon. And then you do have to deal with the challenges um, outside of just seeing patients. So for instance, I saw patients um, today, but I need to, we have an anniversary event coming up. So try to think go over the logistics with my staff to make sure that's all in place. Um, hiring, firing employees, I have to manage that. Marketing, payroll. So these things that just take time um, on top of just seeing patients that you know you may not um, anticipate. So um, just wanted to give you, you know, an overview again of what facial plastic surgery is in terms of procedures, conditions we cover, my current practice, and the different um, pathways for practicing as a facial plastic surgeon. Um, I do then want to, you know, share my screen and, and go over some cases with you so that you could kind of more visually see, um, you know, what I do as a plastic surgeon. And you can definitely see more cases, um, you know, through Instagram or my, or my website, uh, www.drtinahoe.com. Com. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, perfect. So I'm going to take a look at one um, patient. Okay. Um, yes. So this patient let me take a look here. Um, a lot of times I like to do a guessing game if I have, you know, patients um, or sorry, um, students with me more alive who could interact uh, more directly. So this is a lovely patient of mine where um, she first came to me bothered by the heaviness of her brows and eyelids, especially after Botox. So we talked about doing an upper eyelid surgery together, which can actually be done in the office under local anesthesia. So if you can see here on the left, you see heaviness of her upper eyelids. You can't really see the eyelids as well, especially out laterally. And just with one small surgery, you know, by uh, taking off the heaviness of the upper eyes, you see more eyelids show, she looks more refreshed. Often a lot of patients, um, we, uh, the, the eyes show the earliest signs of aging. So she actually became an interesting patient from a reconstructive side as well. Um, about, uh, it was nine days after her surgery at a week. I usually take out the stitches. She called me overnight. She was at the ER, not sure if she could see a plastic surgeon on call, but her um, dog had been startled and jumped up and, you know, um, you know, accidentally uh, uh, nipped her. Um, you know, luckily for her, it was just opening up the wound. It wasn't like um, tissue avulsion, like the, the dog bit off, you know, her skin and, you know, with taking everything into account, she was really lucky. In my mind, a lot of times it could be a lot worse, you know, especially when it comes to the eye and the eyeball structures and such. So um, with her, um, what we did is, you know, you really want to address this um, fairly quickly because you have a risk for infection and for poor healing without, you know, it be, being uh, repaired appropriately. So I really washed out the wound and up playing, placing stitches into the wound by her nose here, as well as to reclose her original wound from her surgery. And again, on the right is where she's well healed, even like at least three months after even the trauma. So she looks, you know, the, the, the face heals really well and quickly that you couldn't obviously tell that she had um, uh, um, first of all, eyelid surgery or trauma to the left eye. And then we can again, look back here where, you know, this is technically the before and after. Um, and then this is with her eyes closed where you can see, you know, the redundant skin on the left and it becomes a faint scar in the eyelid crease, but someone who heals well, you really can't obviously tell um, that she had surgery. The interesting thing with her from a medical standpoint is that this is her about a month out. So after she had the trauma, I saw her another week out and took out the stitches and then it was a watching and waiting. But what I noticed here in her left eye was that it looked like there was new ptosis. Ptosis meaning the eye aperture is not as open and the eyelid is heavy. This is a condition if she had a, had this at baseline where surgeons can do it to help open up the eye more. This is a surgery that I don't do. I usually recommend this to my oculoplastics colleagues who train as ophthalmologists first, only do eye surgery and ptosis repair is a, you know, a very fine nuanced surgery where I feel like those 
those surgeons or facial plastic surgeons who do it all the time should be taking care of it. So I was nervous about this because I had looked before, this was not something she had before, you know, was this associated with her trauma. Um, luckily, just by talking to some colleagues, I was reassured, you know, with healing, the swelling coming down, that it will resolve on its own and just to watch and, and wait. Um, she also had some webbing here, but that also resolved on its own as well. So as I mentioned, again, this is her where her eye came back to baseline, you know, no concerning residual, you know, effects from um, her actual, uh, you know, trauma. This picture shows her, this is before the trauma. So it's seven days out of what it looks like with bruising and such before the stitches are removed. This is after I repaired um, her from her trauma. And then let's see if we have just a couple other views. Again, just take a look where you can see just some of the heaviness, you know, that's taken off, um, you know, how uh, she looks there. Um, and again, just to see some of the heaviness taken off there. So she is someone who then, um, and it's nice, we have a patient that trusts you. A lot of times they may come from um, injectable patients, but then they may come back and they want to pursue more surgery. So she first asked, you know, can we do um, some liposuction? And I said, based on the heaviness of her, you know, um, her lower face, she's really in the, the sag in the tissues. As we get older, gravity pulls things down. Um, a lot of female patients prefer the ideal V-shaped structure to the face that represents the ideal youthful face. But then as we get older, that pyramid flips where this becomes heavy, um, gravity pulls things down, we develop more fullness here. And so then it's like whether a patient needs a facelift or a neck lift. So she ultimately, instead of just liposuction, did a facelift and neck lift with me. So, um, you know, this is, her maybe about six months after, we could see, you know, she has heaviness in the lower face. Um, we call it jowling as well, but just with the face of no, she has just more of that, you know, more um, taper looking face, more definition to her face. And you could also appreciate more on lateral view, you know, how her um, face and neck look as well. Okay, great. So I'm going to now um, show a couple more examples um, here. So I, I'm going to show um, an upper and lower eyelid surgery um, result. And as I mentioned, eyelids usually show the early signs of aging. So this one, you know, often eyelid surgery just goes a long way with, um, you know, restoring uh our attention, you know, back to the eyes, the cheeks, where it's more, you know, refreshed. And in a way, like making them look less noticeable. Um, the ultimate compliment for me as a surgeon is um, when I feel like if a friend or family can tell, you know, there's something different about the patient, but, and they look great, but they can't obviously tell. And they might say, oh, did you get your hair done? Did you go on vacation? Did you get more sleep? Um, so that's the ultimate comment to me as a surgeon. Cause if you notice enough, I mean, sometimes the results are just such a dramatic improvement. And, and if it's their mother who knows their face so well, but if they notice enough, say just something, for instance, like Botox, then it, it's to the common eye, it's as if it's like a little bit too unnatural, you know, or, or too artificial looking. So this patient here, I did upper eyelid surgery, lower eyelid surgery, um, and she's about six months out. So you can see overall, you know, you look on the left, she's got the skin laxity, heaviness, the lower eye, the upper eyelids, you can't really see um, as much the, um, her eyelids, but more on the right, you can see more show her eyes are popping and then the lower eyelids um, signs of aging include puffiness like lower eyelid bags where it's fat that's pushing out through a weakened layer um, having some hollowing because the cheeks have dropped a bit and we have it looking more sunken here and then um uh, skin laxity as well, like just the crepiness or the skin is just not as tight. My usual approach to lower eye surgery is three steps. So you can see here, you know, it looks more smooth. You don't, you have the eye bags that are gone. We can't achieve things perfectly, you know, to get you back to 20 year old eyelids. But as you can see, just we've really helped to turn back time on her face. Um, the lower eye surgery, three-step approach. The first um, 
part is the actual lower eye surgery itself to remove the fat that's pushing through a weakened layer. Um, I call it a transconjunctival approach, which, which means like a scarless eyelid surgery, but I make a cut on the inside of the eyelid. That's the first step. The second step, um, and I remove the fat that's causing the um, bags in the eyes. The second step is fat transfer. So now the lower eye is a little more sunken. I take, I harvest some fat from like say the thigh or act when we're doing some liposuction. We process that fat, then we re-inject it like we do for filler, um, where we inject it in the lower eyelid area area and then we do it in the cheeks and elsewhere that they need so you can see you know we fill it in to make it look smoother and you can see that her cheeks look a little more lifted and projected from the fat transfer there as well and then the third component is to do co2 laser um, all over to tighten the skin and this helps me avoid an outer scar um, with the um, eyelid surgery and i'm just going to go through and just go through a couple you know before and um, some more before and afters Looks yeah, closer. Okay, perfect. And then let's take a look at. And then this is another younger patient. As I mentioned, a facial jawline contouring is my niche. Patients who want just more definition, less fullness, want more of that V-shaped look, especially in the female patients. So I do injectables like Botox and filler to help with contouring. I perform buckle fat removal, liposuction here, mini neck lift, neck lift to really help. So it's a nice spectrum of surgical and non-surgical procedures to help patients achieve results. Um, so this patient was bothered by her round face, chubby cheeks, also the fullness under her chin. So she wanted to pursue, you know, surgery to have some more facial jaw and contouring. We ended up doing buccal fat removal as well as chin liposuction and Botox to the masters, like back here to atrophy this muscle um, to help her with her, uh, you know, her facial contouring um, goals. So let's see here. So I'm going to kind of go out of order but on the left is before and the right is after. And so you can see on the lateral view here, see how she has this fullness, but now she has this nice contour. It looks you know, smooth, reduced, more youthful as well. And just kind of the more shadowing, the definition, she doesn't have as much fullness here. Um, and then as you can see on the front um, view, um, and then it's the lateral view again, just this nice sharp definition there. And here, so um, as you see, she looks very square and very full here. The buckle fat removal, kind of like if you patients are looking in the mirror and they do this motion, and they wish right here was a little more slender, more contour. I'm doing something exaggerated, but we can remove a walnut size amount of fat on each side um, to slim that. So you see the shadowing a little bit here, and then I injected Botox out here to really slim this so it's less of a square and more contoured in, in, in terms of her results. And then if you're interested in actually um, watching some of the procedures, whether it's eyelid surgery, buccal fat removal, I do have those videos um, available um, on Instagram or on my website. Um, and then just one more patient, this is more from a, a non-surgical um, uh, standpoint, just to see kind of the power of what injectables can do. So I ultimately did, you know, Botox in the upper face to rejuvenate, minimize wrinkles, but this is her at rest. I did some cheek filler, Botox in the masters again. And as you can see, just like she, she's uh, someone who's, who is um, uh, a fitness class instructor, you know, so works out a lot, but for her, she's just started to look more masculine with some laxity in the face, just harsher contours and lines. So by doing um, some filler and Botox just to help soften, restore some volume in certain areas that I need, I help to make her look more youthful and more, you know, V-shaped face in the, um, the right side.
And I did do some jawline fillers. Well, you can see it just looks more crisp as well. And like a little bit of a more a highlight and, and pop to the cheeks and all subtle improvements. She doesn't look overdone, but she definitely looks very refreshed. Um, so anyways, I think that's it for now. Hopefully that's just given you, you know, some cases to think about. And I, I do have more um, on Instagram, and my website. So I'd love to open it up for questions at this time. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much, um, Dr. Ho, for all that. Um, it's really interesting to see cases, especially just with the comparison um, with multiple pictures, seeing the before and after. Very, very interesting to see. Our first question is about training pathways. So you mentioned you took a fellowship in facial, plastic, and reconstructive surgery. Could someone take that as a residency? Is there the option to take it as both a residency and a fellowship, just depending on your training pathway? Um, so you, so the minimum residency is three years regardless. Um, so say if you knew you were plastics oriented to begin with, you could go the general plastic surgery route. Um, there are, there still is a track of like matching into general surgery first for five years and then doing, um, or five to seven, if you do academics, um, an academic one with research and then a three-year fellowship in plastic surgery fellowship. But if you know you're very plastics minded and that includes doing surgery on the body as well, you could try it. It's ultra competitive. You try to match into an integrated track where it's a six year track for plastic surgery. You do within that three year, your first three years are general surgery, just to learn to do surgery in the whole body. And then the rest of it is to focus on plastics. Um, a number of plastic surgeons do still um, fellowship later, whether it's more like a cosmetic or aesthetic fellowship, um, hand surgery, breast surgery, cranial facial. If you want to do what the surgeries I had or like cleft lip, cleft palate, that is historically covered by um, plastic surgeons in the country. I, I would say that I felt intimidated going that route to think like, oh, six years and plus another two to three years or going the eight year track, an additional two to three years if I had to do general surgery first. So it was nice with um, ENT facial plastics that it was just um, six years. Um, you could potentially... It just be really hard if maybe if you did general surgery, but you they but still the facial plastic surgery fellowships really want ENT trained surgeons because it's just so specialized. Um, dermatologists they wouldn't want it if you are more interested in the eye area. You could do you know um, ophthalmology and oculoplastics, but there is some overlap like oculoplastics and facial plastic surgeons. General plastic surgeons can all do eyelid surgery. You know I would say oculoplastic surgeons can do the tougher you know, more nuanced cases. And then in terms of practice right now, you're in Philadelphia. Um, so that's on the East coast more. So are there differences in practicing, let's say just in the same big city setting, let's say from a place in California um, to Philadelphia from East coast to West coast, do you see differences between you and your colleagues? Uh, sure. I think in general, so you think more in a bigger place. So Definitely Philadelphia is a saturated market. Um, you know, there's a lot of rhinoplasty surgeons. So for instance, I wish my rhinoplasty practice was more robust. Maybe if I had joined an ENT practice first, I could have seen more patients with nose issues, including breathing issues that I could have repaired. But there's a lot of surgeons who do rhinoplasty here. Um, I do hope I'm making my mark because there's no other facial female facial plastic surgeons in Philadelphia or immediate Philadelphia area. Um, and I felt like coming here, you know, it's not cheap to live in Philly, but the cost of living is more reasonable. Of course, it'd be much more intimidating to try to start a practice in New York or LA, like Beverly Hills, just because it's even more ultra saturated, but the price point is higher there, whether you say it's Botox or getting facial cosmetic surgery, it's just a different beast. But, um, uh, and, and you think about cost of living is much more, you know, relative. So from, if you want to you know, be in private practice, be on your own, you know, you may feel like you need to kind of, um, you're just, uh, how do you put it? Like, um, really putting your neck out there, you know, to, to, um, you know, put your, open your practice more in, you know, um, LA or, um, New York. Sometimes if it's too intimidating to start off on your own, um, and you want to be in either of those 
like ultra competitive areas, you know, you could think about say joining a bigger practice where it's academics to get your experience first or joining Kaiser, like a, a bigger medical group or bigger ENT group to get some exposure and then go off on your own when you're more established in terms of experience and financially. So you established your practice straight out of training, right? I've always been in practice, prior practice, but I was an employee first for a couple of practices, you know, before I decided to go off on my own. So, um, and the space that I found, I'm subleasing, which is good. It was already a med spa space before, so I didn't have to build it from scratch in a nice way. So I didn't have to get an extra loan just in a building out. All I needed to do was um, repaint the walls and redo the flooring, which I could pay, you know, with a credit card out of, you know, what, I had saved up from practicing for two or three years beforehand. Um, I did have to take out a bank loan when it came to bringing in some of the devices that the estheticians use. My own practice, not only is it me, but I have a couple of esthetician providers who does do the skin resurfacing part. I have another nurse injector who does Botox and filler too. In terms of insurance, so I'm sure there might be some challenges between cosmetic versus reconstructive. Is that right? Just mm -hmm. with the coverage that insurance will have for those types of surgeries? Yes. So insurance, and I did have a taste of it my first practice at the dermatology practice. Um, so what usually happens is like, say I remove um, like a, a, a skin lesion, like a mole, but we have a concern, it, you know, could be cancerous or we want to make sure it's not cancer. Say we value it, like for my time, we think the procedure is worth $600. And so we build that. The insurance will come back and say, well, it's only worth $300 and it's based on their criteria. And then they say it will only cover $50 of it. So then the patient gets the bill for $250. And of course, the patient always gets upset with the doctor's practice, right? And so as the surgeon, you only upfront get paid $50 and you're hoping the patient pays the $250. And you then, as a surgeon, if it's not your own practice, you get only a cut of that, you know, because your practice has to take you because I thought, well, you should only get this percentage. Like I was, you know, had a 45% because we have to pay the front desk, you know, we have to pay for the supplies. So it all kind of trickles down where you see like that's, it's not, you don't get paid that much, you know, and hopefully if the patient pays their part of it. Um, you know, in, pri in a cosmetic, I don't take insurance. I'm cosmetic only and cash only. There's pluses and minuses. Minuses are, I miss the reconstructive side. I don't see as many of those cases, but then the benefit is straightforward. I don't have to have a biller on st um, staff, you know, patients pay up front. So it's all on them. Um, so it, it, my income is more um, predictable and it's higher. And so for me, if say that same mole that a patient wants to, you know, have removed, um, I charge 500 and I know the patient's going to pay it. And that comes all to me. And then another student asks during your training, did that help specifically your training years? Did that help any with the business side of owning a private practice? Is that something that they would? in that kind of specialty, tailor training or advice, guidance, mentorship towards? That's a really good question. ENT alone, you don't get that much. I think we just have so much from the, the clinical training side to learn. We had some lectures, but it was just still far removed. Like maybe we had about like investing in retirement and such, but I wish, you know, we could more formally, um, you know, uh, I guess, um, understand that. Um, at the same time, it was good that I traded different environments to see what like private practice model was like versus, you know, academics and have more of exposure there. Um, facial plastics, especially being in a private practice oriented one, I saw more of how to run a business, especially from the marketing side, you know, how to have some certain steps. But in the day, you still have to learn it. Like I have great mentors that I could refer back to, especially from private practice from the fellowship to ask, you know, certain questions. And I have a, um, a network of other facial plastic surgeons who are either older than me or female ones. I meet with a group of female facial plastic surgeons virtually once a month to kind of bounce ideas off, you know, whether it's, um, Hey, hiring challenges or headaches, what would you do here? Or some are very ambitious. Like they say, I'm building a surgery center. You know, what input do you have? Or I'm looking at this device. Um, the nice thing is when I was in my transition, for my second practice and it just wasn't working out, you know, 
my, uh, my female colleagues gave me the encouragement to say, Tina, you're doing a lot on your own, you know, as your own LLC, as an independent contractor, you should just do it, go off on your own, you can do it. And to be able to ask, you know, other servants, hey, what do you use for your uh, uh, credit card processor or for your electronic medical record, just even those straightforward, it's nice to know what others have used, if they like or don't like. In terms of um, the use of laser in certain procedures, what kind of procedures do we see that in? And are there specific trainings during your fellowship years or maybe a separate fellowship for specifically laser surgery? Right. So if you're most interested in laser and for skin resurfacing, I recommend more the dermatology route because being a skin expert first. Um, and if you want to really work with a lot of lasers, because if you're in your practice, I mean, I'm, I don't enjoy doing laser as much either. Yes, you don't really have as much of a cost to it, but you have to like pay for a device, whether it's 100,000, 200,000, and then make the return um, on it. For me, it's more worth my time to when I don't enjoy it. Laser is that to pay the estheticians, you know, to do that and pay the devices off. Um, laser, in my practice, I do CO2 laser resurfacing to help, as I mentioned earlier, to augment my eyelid surgery results, um, my facelift results. You know, you just think skin rejuvenation goes hand in hand with what I do, whether it's injectables or surgery. Um, there's other CO2, there's other lasers out there like Erbium and DIAG that are also for rejuvenation. Um, you have skin tightening devices, you have intense pulse light to help with improving pigment in the skin. Um, and ENT, we also use laser, whether it's CO2 or KTP laser, where we kind of want to improve, like take out vascular lesions like of the face, um, or we want to do airway surgery. That's just, so there's medical uses for um, using lasers as well. From a training standpoint, you know, as a surgeon, um, I, like learned it of just hands-on doing CO2 laser. I wouldn't necessarily say I need to do extra certification, except maybe to say that, you know, I understand and I've done a number of cases. Um, when you buy a device, you have reps and trainers that can help, you know, certify you on their device to make sure that, but at the end of the day, as a, a surgeon, as a physician, and we have estheticians, I am myself accountable to my patients, responsible for any complications. And that's also for any providers I oversee. Since you started training, I'm sure there's been some updates to the specialty, some advances. Mm -hmm. um, what have those been? What have those looked like? How much has the specialty progressed since training? Um, that's a good question. So there's always like new or injectables, laser devices, non-invasive or lesser invasive, you know, that are in the market. Um, but what's been most interesting to me, I think in the age of the pandemic and with plastic surgery being very popular um, and Instagram, you know, being having more pre presence for marketing, uh, a couple of surgical techniques have become much more popular. One is the deep plane approach to neck lift and facelift. Um, you have certain names in the field like Jacono, Dr. Nike and St. Louis. And I think with patients like more bothered by necks and looking at Zoom, Tech Neck, and uh, it's not just doing liposuction or a lesser like sculpting kind of neck lift. And I myself became more in tune with this. I watched their videos. It's a type of approach I didn't learn in training. And I taught it myself um, to do it. And again, so along the lines of my contouring patients that need a main neck lift, that's my niche that patients find me and want to pursue the deep plane approach to neck lift. From a rhinoplasty standpoint, um, you know, I'm not there since I don't do rhinoplasty that often, but preservation rhinoplasty is um, a very hot um, topic and approach right now. What that means is, so traditionally say someone has a hump um, in, in their bridge. What we literally do is underneath the skin, we will like chisel it down and shave it down you know, to take down a hump on the bridge. Now you can depend on the right patient because a lot of times by chiseling, drilling and such, you're leaving irregularities, um, you know, to the bone um, with healing is that they'll make a cut deeper, like in the cartilage and basically shift the bone down. So you're not really directly addressing in this, but shift it down because you're taking that things down lower in the, um, in the, in the, the, cartilaginous network, the support framework, that then you just have 
it, it's less disturbed or undisturbed and it's just, um, you know, a, a better result. So it's interesting. I haven't observed that kind of surgery. I've seen results from surgeons from it. Um, so it'll be interesting, you know, to learn more about it at meetings. You talked about the, the pandemic. Um, from what we've heard, things like elective surgeries were kind of cut out of, of that time since they were just trying to limit spread. So being involved in cosmetic surgery, how did that affect you? How did you go around that? All right. So my um, situation is unique. You know, I'm a younger surgeon, I'm so, so I'm still building different than someone who's established. So one fortunate thing for me, I had my first son um, February 27th, 2020. So right before the shutdown. And so I was lucky enough to spend my maternity leave during like the three months to be on maternity leave. So especially in private practice, you know, downside there is like, you don't get paid for your time off, you know? So, um, so when you own your own practice, you have to think about the time you spend away, whether it's having a baby, going to vacation, you're not making money. You're in fact losing money because you need to have the office open. You need to have someone to cover the phones. Um, so I, otherwise, if I didn't have a newborn, I think I would have been driving myself crazy, you know, sitting three months at home, not doing anything. So that the initial impact of, oh, no more surgeries, you know, affecting practices monetarily, you know, it was a big deal. But um, with patients then being virtual, so then you have the onset of virtual consultations. Um, they're looking at themselves in Zoom and think, oh, look at all these lines now, my neck. And again, these are among the people who are financially stable. Um, so then they're thinking, oh, I, I want to now pursue injectables or surgery for these issues I'm seeing on myself. I could afford it and I have the downtime to do it. And I can hide, you know, what I'm doing because I'm working from home. So there actually was a boom in plastic surgery, which is interesting enough that a lot of um, plastic surgery and with the realm of Instagram and promoting certain approaches to surgery, a lot of surgeons now on the flip side have really benefited from it. And I have had patients find me from out of town. So I have an increasing presence of out of town patients wanting to do surgery with me, which is neat. Um, and patients who are like, I want to get surgery done. I'd like, can you book me at, in two weeks or in four weeks? So it's been kind of a crazy time in a good way. Mine's more like ebbs and flows, but I think that comes with a younger practice, you know, kind of in a way starting over um, and doing it a year ago. In terms of other providers like nurse practitioners, PAs, et cetera, who do you often see within the frontier of plastic surgery? Is it PAs, nurse practitioners? Yeah. Um, so in my practice of those who can really assist me with patients, I mainly use medical assistants, especially those who are, you know, college students or pre-med, like just um, recently graduated, that I feel that they... Um, are, uh, you know, very eager, motivated, easy to train, even if I can't hold on to them for that long. I don't really have a role for like NPs and, and PAs, like to assist me and such, especially so that maybe because I'm not, you know, uh, a super established, really busy surgeon. Some may use them to um, see patients to take off dressings and take out stitches and see them for the post offices. But I still prefer to see my patients, you know, be very hands on because they paid to do that elective surgery with me. But there are PAs or MPs that help with the post operative visits um, and that they can also help assist in the operating room. Where I operate, I already have a scrub tech who helps me, but um, they can help, you know, make things more efficient in clinic and be, help you be faster as a surgeon. They can even help close the surgery. They just can't do the surgery. Um, otherwise, from a non-surgical standpoint, this is where I think there's a more of use. That's why I have a, one NP um, injector with me, what we're trying to build our practice is that PAs and NPs, again, with the appropriate experience and training and supervision, they can do injectables. They can do skin resurfacing um, or lesser invasive procedures and help, you know, bring more revenue in for you as well also screen patients and tell them, hey, I can't do that, you know, and I want to refer you to Dr. Ho for surgery. Um, but there is a, you know, in that sense, like there's, it's very popular for nurses, PAs, MPs who want to do injectables like Botox and filler. That's, you know, continuing to um, definitely become a bigger and bigger um, field. Absolutely. We like to really ask this question as we wrap up um, today's session in terms of what students can do to get involved. So you mentioned MAs being involved in your practice. That must be one way that students can go ahead and get a glimpse into what plastic surgery is. Any other opportunities that 
you've seen students go through to get a um, Yes, I would just say reach out to observe. So find like, you know, cold email or call local plastic surgeons and say, I'm a student, I'm pre-med, I'm interested. There's an opportunity, can I come shadow you in clinic or in the operating room, especially when things are more normal now, um, that those just make sure that you enjoy surgery. Are you okay with looking at blood, you know, not fainting, you like um, seeing procedures, um, you're, you enjoy seeing the spectrum of patients that we treat, um, in our specialty, you know, that's the, the best to get in the door and then go from there. If you want something more dedicated, especially for your CV and some compensation, I think being a medical assistant is an excellent way um, to go, um, you know, or interning that you have that, you know, more close exposure to being really part of patient care. Um, and if you're affiliated with an academic um, program, especially, I mean, this is like kind of thing more, you know, long run and more, you know, you can still wait to medical school to have these opportunities. But if you know if there's an affiliated, you know, ENT or plastic surgery department, like through the medical school where you're, um, you're you know, you're at um, inquiring about research opportunities to be to get involved in research projects. I'm sure there's a lot of things that go outside of patient visits that you have to kind of guide patients over um, like tips, advice over just keeping their skin, their face looking young and youthful. Um, so a lot of college students are here on this call. Um, any tips that you have for them or just generally patients um, about keeping that youthful look? Um, it's a good question. So, you know, always take Instagram with a grain of salt, but it is a go good source of information if you follow, you know, certain accounts, um, you know, for uh, skincare and such. Being preventative is key. So think um, sunscreen, 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 sun protection. So minimum SPF 35. I really like the hydrogen from Elastin where it has a tint to it. So it can be like act like a concealer too um and stay out of the sun so I, I think the trend is there but don't like you know don't go to tanning beds right and try to limit your sun exposure when you go to the beach um after that you know the best um if you can tolerate it uh, for anti-aging, for wrinkles, and it can help with acne, acne scarring is retinol or tretinoin. It's your vitamin A derivative. If you've heard of retin A for acne, that's your tretinoin. So um, you can get it over the counter or you can get it at a you know plastic surgeon or doctor's office or men's spa. Anything you buy at a physician office is always gonna be better, like higher grade, medical grade, but more expensive. Um, and products you buy more like Sephora or Ulta, you know, not necessarily less for medical grade. So that's, you're always, you know, good complaint. You can try to take um, once or twice a day. And then depending on your skin needs, um, I think a good eye cream, a good neck cream, it's, it's not gonna prevent you from having surgery, but it's good for preventative. There's other um, kind of products like vitamin C serum, helps with pigmentation, um, high, hyaluronic acid. That's what is found naturally in your skin to pump it. It's also what's found in filler as a modified form. So that can help, um, you know, to kind of plump or hydrate the skin. So, um, so the sky's the limit when it's come, I like to be simpler, you know, less is more to keep it simple, but, um, a sunscreen that's like sun protection, a tretinoin or retinol, and then, you know, adding on things like eye cream, um, neck cream, vitamin C serum, you know, are helpful. You mentioned how the specialty has changed since training, but looking forward to the future, the next 10, 15, 20 years, where do you see plastic surgery going? How do you see it evolving? Um, so definitely the non-surgical less invasive route is still going to, you know, push whether it's like anything else that can penetrate more deeply for skin tightening and resurfacing or something that can go, you know, there's certain techniques to avoid surgery. There's a lot of patients who are just still fearful of surgery, the downtime, you know, whether to resuspend the tissues. I do like that there's this been trend for back to fundamentals with the deep plane approach being, a, um, being um, you know, most effective. And I hope we keep that trend because for some conditions and issues, only surgery can do that to get the best, most traumatic um, results. Um, you know, I think we'll see um, on the horizon is a neurotoxin, usually Botox Dysport lasts up to three months. There's one that's just finally recently FDA approved where the effects can last up to six months. So I think that's gonna be a game changer, you know, for patients, of course, if they wanna, don't have to come in as much and pay overall less, you know, less often for a neurotoxin, it makes sense to, you know, pursue that, um, treatment. So I do think, you know, injectables that will contribute, you know, um, more and more injectable 
procedures in terms of more advanced product um, for us to use. So, so non-surgical will continue to, you know, uh, press forward, um, you know, from an advancement standpoint. Absolutely. You mentioned ENT being a competitive specialty and definitely plastics being a competitive um, specialty. So in your case, when you're going through the application cycle, what do you believe really stood out to you to make those interviews and to make those selections to match eventually into these programs? Um, you definitely need baseline scores. I would say I was like very average in my class, but made up for my step two score. I mean, at the end of the day, like um, I would like to think of my story, just a good work ethic, um, you know, pays off. You only need to match the one program. You do statistically want to, you know, hopefully get a certain number of interviews so you feel comfortable that you your chances of matching are good enough. Um, at the end of the day, if, you know, from a, if other ENT surgeons, especially who you work with, you know, let us a recommendation, getting good research experience, but if they see, and it's reflected in the, in the recommendation letters that, you know, personality wise, you click well um, with them, that you have a genuine interest and, you know, you're smart enough um, that it can go a long way and you, you work hard, you know, you, you will find a fit within this specialty for ENT and eventually facial plastics. Another question is about pre-matches. So we sometimes hear about pre-matches for residency. Is that something that goes on within more competitive specialties like ENT and plastics? Um, so if you're running a pre-match, maybe like to match directly into the field. Uh, so for ENT, that's the only way. You have to match into ENT. You, it's not like general surgery. If you want to do it, it's only if you like maybe or advanced enough, you can find a spot, but it's all or nothing for ENT. And then for facial plastic surgery, I think for the most part, they're only going to take someone who did an ENT training because only a focus in the head and neck. There have been ENT surgeons who decided to do a cosmetic fellowship that they want to do in the body and they got accepted. Plastics, that's maybe if you're asking a pre-match where you either do general surgery first or you try to see if you can get into one of those select spots to match in plastic surgery alone. And it takes less time, six years. And then one more thing about medical school, a little earlier on, what do you think made the difference for you in terms of being selected? Was it more or less the same in terms of good scores? For um, medical school yeah. to get in. So I would say this um, MCAT was my toughest exam. It was a big wake up call. I wish I had done better, had done well in undergrad. And I think um, you realize when you're in a certain tier of other people who are really good test takers, I'm not just a good test taker. I need to um, carve out the time to study. I think my study skills kind of slacked in undergrad because I could get by with, I had AP credit, I could get by with um, studying last minute, like for organic chemistry and such. So I'd really emphasize emphasize, you know, early on, have the focus, be serious, know that you want to do medicine, because if there's something you're just as interested in, also in, outside of surgery too, strongly consider it, because it just takes this certain kind of focus, sacrifice, um, you know, rigor mentality to stay in the game and, you know, and, and you want to enjoy it, right? Like for me, my husband would say I work all the time, but I really enjoy what I do. Um, and, and have good study habits, like especially from the beginning, because I struggle with that. I did get some professional help while well, I was in residency just to do well enough for myself and make sure I was always passing my exams and I was never at, you know, the, at the top. Um, so that will help me whether it's like how to address certain questions and also having a study schedule because it just becomes more and more individualized, like on you to put in the time to study on the side. It's not like you, you have, you know, like say in whatever, high school or earlier, like, you know, that is just taking care of like, you know, certain homework and such. It's, it's more independent, um, uh, driven. So you need to have a good enough MCAT score. You need good enough recommendations and have it show that genuine interest in medicine, whether it's through volunteer experiences and research. And, um, I know I'm very far removed from medical school. I just, went through my, uh, went to my 10 year reunion last weekend. So it's a long time ago. Um, but also having good interview skills. Um, I know I think it's virtual mainly, but you have to be able to present well, answer certain questions. Sometimes there's ethical questions presented at you, but to be able to show that you're mature and have a genuine interest in patient care. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up today's session. I have a few last reminders for our shadowers. So at the start, I mentioned that you can earn credit for your attendance. To do so, you must pass the quiz. That quiz is now available on our um, virtual shouting page on the website. If you scroll a little down, you'll see 
two buttons, one for our Monday quizzes, and then this one's gonna be marked as a Wednesday quiz. Um, so click that and you'll be, gui you'll be guided to a Google form where you can complete the quiz. Again, 60% or higher. So six out of those 10 questions must um, be correct in order for you to pass. And you'll receive a certificate, which will be sent to the email that you list on the quiz. So make sure that the email is one that you're using frequently. Um, we suggest using a personal email like Gmail, Yahoo, since school emails sometimes filter out things. Um, but that quiz will be due next week on Wednesday, October 5th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you have any questions, let's say you're not able to find the certificate, even after looking through your inbox and spam folders, please email us. Again, our email is shadowing.h, the number four, h at gmail.com, and we will get to you. We'll help um, sort that out for you. Um, and feel free to reach out with really any questions over there. Also, it's posted in the chat box, so you can really access the quiz either way. For our next shadowing session, that's gonna be next week on Monday. Um, we mainly work around a Monday and Thursday schedule, but sometimes we have uh, sessions that are scheduled on a different day or different time. So definitely be sure to look out for that on Instagram or our listserv so you're in the loop. But next week we'll have um, a PA with us, G Gabriella. She is a board certified PA with experience in nutrition education and diabetes management. Um, so we're going to be seeing her at 7 p.m. Central this Monday, October 3rd. Like I said, follow us on Instagram and keep an eye via our listserv by subscribing for you to hear more about these opportunities. Um, Dr. Ho also has her Instagram handle. Would you like to share that again, just for our students? Yes, it's uh, D-R-T-I-N-A-H-O, Dr. Tina Ho. So I appreciate the support and happy to answer questions through DMs there, um, you know, and be a re resource. So thanks so much. Absolutely, we really appreciate it, Dr. Ho. Um, to our students, thank you again for joining in. We'll see you next week. And again, Dr. Ho, thank you so much for joining us to speak. This is a new specialty for us, and we're very, very excited to have seen kind of the ins and outs of it in terms of private practice and also patient cases. It was really an honor to, to get to have a look at that. Awesome. Thanks.